So I'm here today with Colin Turner. He is an author and an activist. Uh, he's recently done a TEDx talk, which we'll uh, talk a little bit about in the interview. Um, I'm delighted to have him here. Colin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I've, I've read your book. You've written two books. One's called F Day. The other one's called Into the OE. F Day is a novel. Uh, Into the OE is more of a more of a sort of non-fiction um, explanation of the open economy. So why don't we start there? I mean, that's that that's obviously your main theme. So why don't we start there? Give us a brief introduction uh, as, as to what an open economy is all about. Sure thing. Thanks for a lot for having me on, Erica. It's, I'm delighted to uh, to talk to talk about this to anyone who will listen. And um, what we have then, what we're talking about, is an open economy or an open access economy. Um, anyone who's um, familiar with the scholarly world will be familiar with the expression "open access," which basically means that um, that the that all sort of um, scientific and scholarly uh, research is publicised. So it's put in, into the public domain, as we know that a lot of uh, scholarly research is um, privatized and uh, more or less kept behind lock and key. So um, the open access economy then is basically a way of extending that philosophy to uh, the economy in general, where we don't keep resources and um, services under uh, lock and key as we do now. And it, in the short, long story short, basically we, ha we have an economy where everything is free, where um, we uh, people volunteer to uh, keep society, the business of society going, and we use technology to to uh, fill in the gaps where we um, the things that we maybe not, do not want to do so much. So at the moment, in our current economy, access to resources is granted through the exchange of money for those resources, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And so, and resources are, I guess. A value is placed on resources by how much money they attract, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, as as most people know who are um, who have maybe questioned capitalism or the way that society works in general these days, is that we have created this kind of arbitrary value system on everything, which has kind of made us a bit crazy. That we're assigning this numerical value to all things and all beings, and uh, it's it's kind of made us a little bit insane where we're actually prioritizing the numerical value of things over the actual esoteric value or the physical value or um, the amenity of those of those things so in a way the the numerical what i call it like a numerical insanity has kind of overtaken um, normal rationale and common sense in so far as that we actually have a society now where even though it is technically feasible to actually feed and clothe and house everybody, even though it's technically feasible to do that quite easily, we still um, have a, we put everything behind a value wall where basically you must justify your existence in terms of this numerical um, value, in terms of your, your wages or your, uh, your personal wealth. And you you use this um, to access the various resources we need. I, mean, I, I think there's a there's a there's a key point that we need to home in on here, and that is that um, as as you've already pointed out, you know, technologically it's quite feasible to feed, clothe, house, provide clean water, education, internet access, blah blah blah, for everybody on this planet, right? But um, by keeping these things scarce, or at least the appearance of scarcity in these things, this increases their profitability, right? There's a, and, and that, that I think alludes to the sickness, to the insanity that you were talking about. Um, and, and, and that concept of scarcity, whether real or created or imagined, is, is absolutely central to all of this, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like I say, this uh, the, this numerical insanity has created this sort of uh, like a, num a numbers game where everything has is attributed a value, and your time is has a certain value, your um, resources and your skills have a certain value, and um, you must um, you must uh, be you must cr generate wealth with the value that you have or not. And um, that wealth that you create grants you access to the things that are required to live. To, to try and solve problems in society, for example, homelessness. Yeah, if you want to solve a problem in society, but there is no way to make a profit out of doing so, then that problem can never be solved under this paradigm, right? It's simply impossible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of the, the governments and um, NGOs are starting looking now towards ways of trying to create sustainable and 
ethical methods of uh, conducting society. But I mean, this, this obviously it's it runs completely counter to the uh, to the numerical um, uh, insanity that I'm referring to. That basically uh, everything must justify itself in, in a numerical way. So um, the ethics and sustainability must always, by definition, they must always take a, a second seat or a third seat behind um, behind this profit incentive. And the reason for that is is that the because our because this numerical insanity is index linked to our means of survival, and that means we must use these numbers to to great to um, to afford the means of survival. Because of that, then this it, it completely overtakes our survival instinct, which is obviously our most powerful or most yeah. So our survival instinct is transmuted into an instinct to make money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and it's and it's perfectly it's perfectly rational rational when you actually when you reason it out that um, it's not just that we want enough money for to have the things that we need to live today, but also we all we all fear for the future because we don't know the future. So we want to really, we really want to amass as much personal wealth as possible. Well, that's what greed is, right? Fear of scarcity yeah. in the future. That's yeah. exactly what greed is all about. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. So it secures our future then. So, I mean, this, this idea, people say, well, why are people so greedy? Why, why do people do that? But actually, there is actually a perfectly rational explanation for people's greed. And that is that people just want to have safety and security in the future. And really, you can't argue with that. I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable way to Absolutely. behave, I think. And what happens is then, of course, then with certain individuals, and these are individuals really are largely a minority, they have this kind of misfiring of this kind of accumulation of, of uh, resources and the, that turns in where they just want, they want millions and billions and billions and billions until that goes on. So, I mean, there's, 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 it, it turns into another kind of kettle of fish where like it turns into kind of like an addictive sort of uh, pursuit. Um, but it, by and large, most people like you and me, and uh, who are kind of I don't know, in or around the middle class area, they really just want uh, enough money for the foreseeable future. You know, we want to we want to see see that our, our future is pretty much secure either in our jobs. Enough, or in to, our, basically, enough to not have to worry about it, basically. Exactly. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, most people, that's most reasonable people I speak to, they just, I mean, it's, they just want to have enough, just not to have to stress about it. Yeah, absolutely. But one of the key uh, features and one of the things that we're, we talk about a lot in the open access economy is, um, is like, if obviously people will, will try and say, well, look, what, what what about if I want a Ferrari? What if I want a, a yacht or the, the big house on the hill? And I think that these things are, are basically distractions because the most important thing that we have to consider um, in any sort of um, change making sort of approach is that um, we have to sort out the, the basics of living. And, the, and that's like your food, your water, your energy, your, your clothes, your house. And, and long term sustainability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And well, if you think about, if you talk about sustainability or non-sustainability, I mean, all that is really like a toxic byproduct of the, the capitalist system where obviously you have to keep generating profits by, by, by creating things that maybe break after a few years. I mean, this is not just capitalism, right? I mean, there's a, you know, every, every system that's been used for the last however many hundreds of years has essentially been the same thing yeah i mean it's 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 rooted resources through the use of money i mean they, even the soviet union even maoist china you know what i mean they still use money they still did cost you know cost analyses of projects and blah 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 you know what i mean it's it's, it's not yeah. unique to capitalism i think it, you know it's a far far deeper issue than capitalism alone it's true, yes. And actually, I suppose when I use the word capitalism, really, I'm referring to all, all those Mon countries. Monetaryism really is what you mean, isn't yeah, it? Monetary capitalism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it's like to say, yeah, all these countries, they, they just have capitalism by another name, or they may be slightly more socialist. Some countries are slightly more socialist than others, but really, by and large, all countries are Exactly. Them. It's all shades of the same colour. Yeah, absolutely. All right, listen, yeah. I, think, I, think we've, I, think we've, uh, <laughs> I think we've covered the sort of... Um, mm you know, the, the, the social, the sociological evils of money. Um, mm. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more nitty gritty. Um, sure. What do you see as some of the practical transitional steps that could be taken to get us from the mess that we're currently in to a more sustainable, holistic, humane type of society? Yeah. Yeah. Of course it is the, the burning question on every activist lips. And um, I think before you can answer that question, I think we have to be very clear about what it is 
we want? What are we actually trying to get towards? Um, because there's, there's quite a different um, mixture of uh, messages out there as well. There's a few different kind of approaches to this kind of future moneyless world. And uh, by and large, it, it falls into two camps. You have the one camp, which basically, okay, let's let science and technology basically more or less run everything. Let's automate everything. Let's build big cities where everything is automatic and, you know, and everything is kind of very, very futuristic and space age. No one needs to work or at least we, we minimize that as much as possible. That's one school of thought. The other school of thought, which is the school of thought that I would more subscribe to, is um, the let's create a more compassionate society. Let's create a society that's more connected, where we're more um, invested in, in each other, where we actually we work more, even because we want to do that, because it it um, it serves us better to do that. So it's in a way um, I don't like to use the word uh, Amish, but it's kind of more along that kind of line of approach where so basically. So you're talking about a simplification and a localization. Not, not no, I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word Amish, but it's a good it's a good way of of keying into where I'm what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is basically where where the. Um, we value community, we value each other, we, 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 uh, we are compassionate towards each other and nature and other animals and that sort of stuff. And by using that as a platform or, or as, as our basic starting point for creating society, then we can apply technology in whatever ways we want with it, by as much or as little as we want to actually solve a, a lot of the, um, the practical problems. So um, it's, it's quite specific in difference. I mean, a lot of people I talk to who support maybe um, the Venus Project or the Zeitgeist Movement are very much in the science and technology camp, kind of saying, let's build a, an environment where basically you don't have to work, where basically things are automated and we'll get we get artificial intelligence out of the box and we'll get this, we'll, we've created like a cybernated um, world. Um, whereas a lot of other people then really just want to talk about, let's, let's build something from a community level, let's create better behaviors on an individual level. George, but these, these two uh, approaches are not mutually exclusive, right? I mean, they, 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 they can borrow yeah. from each other. I mean, you, in fact, I mean, in a way they're complementary because on the one hand, you're talking about a philosophy and a mindset. And on the other hand, you're talking about the tools with mm -hmm. which to, you know, make, make a, a, a smooth, efficient running uh, yeah. infrastructure. So, you know, these two things strike me as being actually very complementary to each other. They don't need to be, they don't need to be set against each other. Yes. No, I'm not, no, they're not, not set against each other at all. And yes, you're right, they can be complementary. But the point is that to, um, you asked me about transition, to create the right yeah. approach for transition, we need to know which are, we, which, are we, which are we putting first? Are we putting science and technology first or are we putting community and individual behavior first? Because these, one of those is the, is the key destination. And so you're talking places, about the uh, use of science and technology, but through the lens of a compassionate society. And it's the lens of the compassionate society yeah, is the place where we need to begin. Yeah. How do we go about doing that? I mean, one of the points I've got written down from having read your book um, yep. is the importance of education. And I completely agree with that. And so how do you see the education of young people and, and ongoing education of older people as well. But how do you see that changing under the current paradigm where everything is about test scores and league tables and, you know, sitting exams and common curriculums and funding issues and so on? I suppose the short answer is um, over time, as our, as our priorities change and as we start to look to other ways of actually interacting with with, the, uh, with, our, with each other and with the planet in the sort of approach that I'm talking about, which is moving more towards compassionate and connected society. If we do that, then education obviously will, will spring naturally from that once people start to realize that, well, actually certain behaviors are actually beneficial and certain are not, are not beneficial, then people gravitate more towards that and the education will, um, will, will spring from that. But um, if we actually, um, on, a, on a side note, maybe we can talk about this later, we are actually creating um, a, an education syllabus at the moment. There's a team of us who are actually creating literally textbooks 
for schools that are um, that are basically trying to instill promote values like compassion and cooperation and uh, social intelligence in young kids. This is something a live project we're actually working on right now um, called Life Games Books. But maybe we don't we don't want to go into that now. So there are, apart from that, there are other. Well, yeah, um, sorry, at what stage at what stage are you at the moment with the development of that? I mean, have you got anything uh, that people could take a look at if they were interested? Well, there's a website, lifegamesbooks.com, that people can look at, but the product actually won't be ready until um, probably April, April or May this year. We're actually releasing an app version first, and then the textbooks will be coming out in September. Okay. So um, that, that, that product, is, it's, a, it's almost uh, ready for market, and we're actually working on the app now as, as we speak. Um, but I, I want to say that you're, you're kind of uh, you're, you're jumping the gun a little bit because you did ask me about transition, and I want to just go back on that point a little bit. Now, in terms of tra transition to actually out of a, a money society into a moneyless society, I think that the first thing you have to consider is how did the money society come about? How did it actually begin? And when you actually look when you actually scratch the surface on that and investigate, it's actually a very, very interesting topic. And, the, and it also shows you how to actually escape from the monetary society and how you actually create the alternative. And if you give me a couple of minutes, I'll explain that. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in basically, in medieval England, which is, a, is a, a good example I use, and it, it probably can be applied mostly across other cultures, but in English, English history is the one that I would know most about. But uh, in medieval England, then we had like this um, feudalism um, uh, arrangement where basically the entire of the United Kingdom was basically split up into, um, into uh, what, what would you call the, the small municipalities or counties which were owned basically by the local lord or baron or duke or whatever. So there was, there was like there was a, all the, the entirety of, the, of Great Britain was basically split up into these little um, these little uh, sort of uh, pockets that were owned by the, the nobility. And if you lived in, 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 on one of these um, lands owned by the nobility, you were obviously a subject of the, the local lord. And what actually happened was that all your, basically all your labor and resources was completely, well, almost completely owned and controlled by his lordship or his baronship. And so what happened was that in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, that actually a lot of people became very aggrieved by that. They, they, they agreed by the excesses of their lords or the barons, and also with the fact that they were pretty much had nothing much to nothing much to gain in life. You know, they were they're, they're, all their labor was pretty much owned. And what actually happened was that these serfs who lived in all these areas, they actually began to convene in secretly in, in forests and in different outlying lands, and they, they began trading. They began saying, okay, well, rather than me just giving over all my labor and my and my my tools whatever to my lord that basically i will actually I, i'm going to go and meet these people on the mountain somewhere and we're going to have a little party and we're going to like do trading and 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 basically from that sprang the idea of markets of free markets this is where the term free market comes from where basically these serfs were kind of sort of semi illegally they were meeting up with other uh, people in similar positions and they were they basically created these free markets, and this is where free market black markets as well in a way, right? It was, it was the it was the the birth of the idea that well, actually, hang on, I can trade with anybody. You know, I can do anything. I can make anything I want, and I can trade with anyone I want. And this was kind of revolutionary right, at, at the time. You know, it's very revolutionary. And so this basically is this is the seed of the capitalism that we see today. This was the beginning of it, and that's sort of that's. That obviously that free market thing proliferated um, widely and qu and reasonably quickly, and of course that's evolved then over and over and over and again now. And of course we now we have billionaires and homeless people, you know. <laughs> so we're kind of uh, we sort of uh, went from one sort of oppressive scenario, we kind of evolved, and then we ended up in another sort of oppressive scenario. So my point is then that if we look at the way free market capitalism began and how it evolved, this is the key to understanding as to how do we transition out of that and into something else. And the short answer is that basically we, we have to now start acting like these serfs did uh, in, the, in this uh, free market, but this time a really free market where actually we're not trading, where we're actually um, giving and taking goods and services with each other 
beyond um, uh, the monetary or the, the trading system. So basically, uh, this means that, well, I'll explain why in a minute, this, or I'll explain how, this, this means that we can actually start um, engaging with the sort of free culture that we want to see in small ways now. So it's a uh, bottom-up thing, it's a grassroots growing from the exactly. bottom-up thing. That's it. It has to be a bottom-up, it has to be a grassroots movement because no other, no top-down social design has ever worked in the past. And it's So do you see any value at all in, you know, um, political demonstrations appealing to your MP? Well, I think that uh, everything does... A, I don't. I don't think any effort is ever wasted. I think that um, protests are good, yeah, because they're good for they're like they're flashpoints for people. They kind of they they make people think. They 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 bring attention to issues. I think that's important, yeah. But I don't think that transition will come from that. I don't think transition ever really has come from that. Mm. I think transition comes from basically from normal people like you and me beginning to behave differently, beginning to act differently, changing our habits towards um, a different way of operating. And that's what happened with the birth of capitalism. And this is the only way I believe that it can happen to transition out of capitalism is we have to start acting and behaving in ways that, that are in that, that sort of system that we want to see. So once again, loads. we're back to education, right? Because that's, that, that, that's, that's the way it spreads, right? Is, is, well, well, no, and I don't necessarily mean formal education in schools. Yeah. I mean, learning yeah. about things, you know? Um, there are loads of um, there's loads of online tools out there now that actually help us to do that. Like Free Worlder is one that we do, which is basically um, it's like a map based inventory of free goods and services that people are offering right now. So you can go on the map, find out um, what things are available for free in your area. Somebody's giving away I don't know a guitar, or they're they're giving away violin lessons or or um, language lessons. Or something. I mean this this is a small uh, a small like microcosm, if you like, of uh, the sort of world that we're trying to aim at. And so this our, is part of the free world charter. I was going to ask you about that. So, I mean, you've mm -hmm. led into it nicely. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the free world charter then was um, a sort of like an aspirational kind of document that I wrote maybe about uh, nine years ago. And it basically uh, describes what I, what I consider to be like the, the foundational principles of a money-free society, which basically is about how we would position our priorities. What, what things should we be prioritizing um, in order to make that work? And in a way, you, can, you could um, align it sort of to like religiosity, maybe. The way that we, we say when we, I don't know, in Christianity, you might say the Lord is the, is the most important thing. And then you have uh, like the, the, I don't know, the the priests and the royalty and you know the way you have this kind of hierarchical system hierarchical system of priorities in your mind of things that basically are really important and things that are not so important and what we did or what i did with the free world charter is i, I said well okay the most important thing is actually nature and our shared fortunes on this planet of all species this is the most important thing mm -hmm. um, of all because this is a physical reality and we cannot whatever we believe we cannot survive unless this thing is actually really um, well sustained and maintained and then uh, the other um just like there's 10 principles in the charter um one of them is about um valuing the, the valuing all species Another one is about saying that we're all equal shareholders in planet Earth, basically, you know, and regardless what anyone says, that we are by birth, we are equal shareholders in that. And, um, that, that, and the other thing is that the best way to actually conduct society on Earth is actually by not using a trading system, but by using education and cooperation to actually um, create a system where everyone gets looked after. Because at the end of the day, if we want to... If we want to maximize our chances of success at life or success of creating a good future world, we have to we have to find the most sustainable and fairest ways to do things. And the fairest and most sustainable way is to do away with the market system, which is basically trashing the planet and basically look after each other, you know, and that's it. And this is this is how we all behave anyway in our in our own little worlds, in yeah. our little in our families, in our tribes, in and our... And yet somehow systems. when it gets scaled up, it gets distorted yeah. into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, well, that's, that's the challenge, really. The challenge is, I mean, if we all kind of 
we all tend to look after each other when we're nice to our family, well, more or less. We kind of, we, we, tend, to, we, tend, we tend to look after our family. We don't ask for payment. We don't really trade generally with our, with our small circle of people. So the big question is, can we actually expand our family out to encompass everybody or at least the, 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 the larger community? I believe it's possible. Yeah, that's really, for me, the, is, the, is the big question, you know, is yeah. can, can we take that innate trust and responsibility towards each other that we do within our small circles, and can we expand that out to? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this research that says that yes. uh, when societies get larger than about 150 individuals, it's no longer possible for everybody to know everybody, you know, mm-hmm. know everybody's stories on an individual level, and therefore they need to buy into other collective stories. You talk about this quite a lot in your book about the impressionability and the plasticity. Mm-hmm of the human mind and how easy, how easily we are influenced. Um, and I mean, it's a double edged sword, right? You point this out in the book. On the one hand, it means that we're very easily manipulated, but on the other hand, it also means that we can change very easily and very quickly. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, 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 and so, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with all of that. Um, talk, just sorry, sorry. I, I, I don't want to do too much talking. This is, it's really about you, but uh, you touched on something a moment ago about, um, letting go you know expanding our compassion beyond our immediate circle of family and friends to include the broader community that would mean going against and again this is this is down to our plasticity and impressionability this means going against centuries of divide and rule where we have been taught to mistrust and be suspicious of the other right um, mm-hmm. So, again, how do we go about overcoming? I completely, listen, I, I'm, I completely am on board with what you're saying. What I'm mm-hmm. not quite getting is practical steps. Mm-hmm. I, think the, I think it's very important to remember that our society, our system that we use that maybe we're not so happy with is a product of our behavior. It's a product of our actions. It's not something that anyone forced on us. We're not... I don't, I really don't subscribe to this theory of this elite who are kind of like whipping us and who are kind of laughing at us or, or trying to turn us into fucking slave batteries or something like this. I mean, I have no time for that because, I mean, society is a product. It's, it's a system that evolves out of collective behavior. You know, there's, there's just no other way to see it. You know, if, if, even if you try to go and control a society, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're going to have a revolution, if people don't like the sort of stuff that you're saying or that you're doing, you know, and you can whip them and whip them and whip them, but eventually you'll be found out, you know, if it's nothing that people doesn't resonate with the behavior that they want to have anyway. And this is why um, certain communist regimes have failed over the years, because it just didn't resonate with the way people naturally want to act. So, so um the point is that um, you asked about letting go. Yeah, in terms of the our behaviours, if we if we want to change our society, we have to change our individual and collective behaviour. It's as simple as that. If we want a more compassionate society, we have to be more compassionate. You know, yeah. if we want a more sustainable society, we have to start recycling more or re- reducing the, the trash that we use. I mean, that's that's no brainer. That sort of stuff. But in terms of actually moving beyond money and uh, creating society that doesn't rely on money, that's not, again, it's not going to come from outside. No one is going to come up with this big magic plan and say, oh, here's how we, we get rid of money. We just do this, 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 this big formula, and we, or we, we build this infrastructure. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen that way either. It has to happen with our individual collective behavior. It's a, it's a yeah. bit of a boring and tiresome answer, but this is, it really is honestly the truth. The only way to actually change society is to change uh, individual and collective behavior. I agree behavior. with you. And that sounds like a lot more, that sounds a lot more realistic than some of the stuff yeah. you hear from activists. You know what I mean? It sounds a lot more down yeah. to earth, a lot more realistic. I, and I want to talk about, um, I mentioned the, the Free Worlder site, which is like something that we did, um, like it's an offshoot of the Free World Charter, where we wanted to put into our things into action, where you can give and share goods and services freely with other people. Um, that's just one site, and this is like a very much a fledgling site. It's, um, it's very much in its infancy. We have like other 2,000 members all around the world or something like that, and it's, it's, it's a bit of a hard slog, I'll be honest with you. It's not, it's not the most... Um, active site, you know, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's like pushing a, a rock up a hill sometimes. Yeah, yeah. We're, what we're doing here is really 
very, very, it's extremely counterculture and uh, counterintuitive in a lot of ways to some people. Um, but that's not the only site that's, um, there's, there are other sites, so there's a whole plethora of sites now like uh, Peerby, you have Karma Tribe, um, Simbi, you have Street Bank, you have um, oh God, the Kindista, um, there's, there's a whole other, I can't remember the others now, but there's, there's at least 10 other sites, some of them really active, some of them not so active, which are basically people unconditionally giving goods and services. And that for me is, that is the golden ticket that uh, if we can make it work where people are starting to goods, give and share goods and services with complete strangers for no reward, for no payment, but in the sort of, in the expectation that they can also receive. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, it changes That's, everything, doesn't it? Instead of under yeah. this model where we're competing with each other, the better I do, the worse you do, mm -hmm. under this gift model, Charles Eisenstein talks a lot about this. I don't know if you've come across Charles Eisenstein. Yes. He yes. talks yes. a lot about this, that under a gift economy, the better you do, the better I do, and the better I do, the better you do. You know what I mean? And yeah. that, and yeah. that it, it, it's, a, it's a better than zero sum game. And, 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 hmm. I, it's a really absolutely, yeah. but there's also a little small thing where basically the, you did something good for someone else, and that's it's like a it's it's um, it's a little rush that we get from when we help other people, but it's kind of uh, muted out because this the, the, because this clamor for numbers because it's linked to our survival basically over overrides everything else. So uh, yeah, absolutely, we we sort of. We have it wrong, really, about giving and receiving. We think that when we give something that we lose, but we don't always lose. We actually, we gain a sort of a, a bit of an emotional hit or a bit of a, yeah, a kick out of doing that, you know. And uh, I see this all the time in the in my own work. I mean, I do a lot of stuff, things for free. I'm sure you do too as well. And it's kind of nice, you know. It's nice when you help somebody out, you know, for a couple, you sit down with them a couple of hours and you help them out with whatever it is they're trying to do. And you know, you get a, you get a bit of a kick out of doing that, you know. But when somebody again pays you a hundred quid or two hundred quid to do that, you don't you don't get that same rush or it masks that that, that feeling. So, um, without without the money system, we actually we can start to actually really experience that idea of the, the rush that you get from giving and um, sharing with other people, you know, because it really is palpable. It's real there, you know, and. Uh, Oh, the first, yeah, absolutely, and 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 I mean, it's it's if everyone is doing it, it's not just about you know, it's it's not, it's not just about the feeling of pleasure yeah. that you get from giving, but it's also the the security that comes in the knowledge that mm -hmm. you know that what what you need is out there for you because that's yeah. that's that's the nature of things, and you know that that yeah. Um, yeah. greed is now transmuted into this confidence that what I need will be there. And, you know, that whole fear of scarcity in the future yeah. thing is gone, you know? Well, that's, you, you hit the nail on the head there. That word confidence really is, is the key to it because if we, because the, the system that we've created on Free World are, is, is not yet a confident system, okay? We have like a literally a... a yeah, yeah, it's too small at the moment, yeah. but it, but it, but it yeah. could be. We have a handful of people giving and sharing very small, low, low value items, and that's fair enough. But that is where we have to begin, you know? And it's low confidence, it's low value, but over time, when it evolves, just like the serfs did in their little free market escapades years ago, that, that we build in confidence in that model, we, build, we feel secure in the fact that when we give something that there's a big wide circle and yeah. it comes back to us later, you know? And the surf and didn't have it, the internet, right? I mean, it cha that, change, yeah. that changes everything. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, this, it really it hasn't been possible before now, I, I, I admit, on a large scale, you know, but the internet makes it possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We have people like offering programming services and uh, like proofreading services. Uh, loads of things. Check it out uh, on, on Free World, and they some of them will say, "Okay, I'll do this. I'll give you an hour of my time, two hours of my time." Or people even offering business advice, actually, which is kind of ironic. But anyway, it's it's interesting. And um, the the point is that when we when enough people have confidence in that system, they will offer more things. They'll offer higher value items, and eventually the confidence will grow to such a point where maybe maybe people can offer houses, people can offer their cars, and that sort of stuff. And stuff because one of the things I wrote about recently, actually, <clears throat> was, I mean, if you owned a house, would you offer your house for free now on one of these websites? Well, of course you wouldn't. You know, it's, it's a ridiculous suggestion. It's like throwing money down the drain. But if you turn that around and say, okay, would you offer your house on this website 
if you knew that actually there were hundreds or if not thousands of other similar houses also being offered yeah. on that website. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you're not losing out so much. Absolutely. You, know, you, can, you can easily give your house away because you can just go and grab another one so that someone else is giving, you know, that sort of stuff. So that's, that's the level of confidence. Uh, that's going to take a while to reach that. Yeah. That's, just level of that's possible. You know, that's possible. And we start with low value items. We start with fucking USB sticks. We start with pens, you know, with yeah, yeah, yeah. small trivial items, small services, which is what we have now. And uh, and over time, this, the confidence in that system will build. And eventually we can we can move towards, you know, um, you know whatever, like giving whole silos of grain or, or, or houses or, or helicopters or whatever, who knows? So it's, it's, not, um, it's not the most tantalizing of visions, really. It, re it's, it like requires work, you know, it re requires effort on people, it requires time. Yeah, but it's, um, it's, a bit, but it's rooted in individual responsibility, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, because, I mean, there, there are other, like, groups who advocate, like, the moneyless sort of system, and, and they, they maybe, they, they would want to build cities, like, to build, build a, like, a, 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 some kind of a very highly technological city and invite people to live there and try out that and to kind of quite like to create like a miniature prototype culture and i think there's some value in that yeah, but for I, sure I, and a lot would be learned even if it failed a lot would be learned in the process right yeah 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 exactly yeah well it, the, the one of the problems is that if it if it failed um it would probably be forever held as an example of of proof that such a thing Perhaps, would never work yeah. Yeah. But for me, I think I think it's a, it would be useful experiments. But I think that unless we um, unless we really tackle the behaviour on a really fundamental individual level, I think I don't think this kind of thing can work full time. You know, because maybe it can work in a small area, in like in, uh, isolated from the rest of the world, like a kind of an island. Uh, it could maybe work like that. But if we want, to, we, we don't want to have like a the whole world with just little islands of communities we want to have a world a whole, a whole connected world helping each other i love i love what michael tellinger does with ubuntu i love charles eisenstein i, I think these approaches for me are the are the more valid ones that we have to uh, we have to start looking to sort of behaving differently and Two, the science and technology we Sorry, don't have to think about science we don't have to think about science and technology because it's already there you know? it's, it's 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 the old um, cliche you know you can you can have technology to to feed everyone or you can have technology to make bombs you know yeah, yeah. And, and until you you actually have the appropriate behavior then uh, well, let's get the behavior right and then we can use technology whatever way we want so technology isn't going away it's not going back in the box and of course um, once we take away the the profit motive it'll be it'll be it can be unleashed really to its fullest potential you know so uh, it's it's all to play for but i think long story short it's um it's going to take time you know it's going to take a lot of uh, work on the on an individual level i think i i see a lot of value in like awareness movements and people like russell brand to talk about spiritual awakening yeah, i've come to really really like russell brand he was a bit of a knob back in the day but i've come to really really yeah. like one of the best interviewers on the on the internet as far as i'm concerned he's, a, he's an absolute genius he really is genius and gentleman but i mean i don't really i don't really go in for this, this kind of spiritual angle so much myself but i see value in it i see value in actually in tran transcending the sort of um, the kind of lizard brain response that we kind of generally take. He's incredibly open, you know, he doesn't reject anything that anyone says. He questions them thoroughly, but he doesn't reject it. And he always builds a rapport with his interviewees. I've, I, I really enjoy, I really enjoy listening to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good guy. He really is a good guy. Yeah, we need a lot more of him. Yeah, we really do. And One more uh, thing I'd like to touch on with yeah. you before I think I think we're probably just about uh, you know I don't want yeah. to bore people for too long so I think we've probably just about done our time but one more thing I'd like to touch on with you which is again something Charles Eisenstein talks a great deal about is uh, is the power of story this is something that I've become very interested in recently is 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 the ability of story narrative mythology mm -hmm. archetype that kind of thing to really shape the way that we interact with the world the way we fit with it if you know what i mean um sure. and it's something that you did in your book not in f i mean f day is a novel anyway and you've done the whole you know the whole thing is couched in terms of story but even uh, in into the oe your your non-fiction mm -hmm. book you had a yes. series of, very, of short stories in there relating people's oh, yeah. experiences of the transition to the new economy. And I have to say, I found that one of the most effective parts of the book, you know, because you, 
and, and this this is the thing with story. I'd like to hear what you think about this. This is the thing with story. It's so much more powerful than a set of instructions because as the reader, you put yourself into the shoes of one or more characters in that story and you live out the thing yeah. through, you know, you live it out in a, in, a, in a real way, in an emotional way. You engage with it with far more of yourself. And so yes, yes. just to close out on, <clears throat> how do you think we could employ that power as part of the process of engendering the compassion yeah. and the collaboration, the cooperation in society? Yeah, well, and one of the other projects that we're working on, um, uh, by the way, I didn't me I did mention that we have, we created this sort of organization called Free World One, uh, which is basically, um, ironically, it's a for-profit company, which is basically for launching different projects that, that we want to launch. And one of the projects that we're hoping to do is actually a movie version of the F-Day book, because uh, it, you're right so that, that the little... Um, the sort of user stories uh, in the interopen economy. Yeah, a lot of people have really liked those. And F Day is really almost like a full-length uh, novel version of that. Um, not so much as more. It's more about uh, transition and the the, the the resistance and transition and that sort of stuff. So um, we're hoping to make that into a movie. I mean, I've actually had some interest from um, a producer in the U.S. and a, a director in the U.S. as well, who basically are interested in seeing a script of that of that book. They they read the book and they love the book. So yeah, that that's one really good vehicle we could use is to actually try and create like a mainstream blockbuster movie. I mean, if it were possible. Um, that would be a fantastic achievement and a way of actually putting the ideas into people that, in a kind of really make them think, hey, what the hell, you know? <laughs> and uh, one of the things that um, one of the, a lot of the feedback I get from that, that F Day book is that it, it makes it sort of seem very, um, very real and very easy and very plausible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really a, a valuable thing to, to, to an valuable asset of the story is the fact that it does seem so plausible. And if we could create a movie like that, uh, I think it, the, the chances of uh, that making a, a, a big impact would be fantastic. But we, the best way to do that is really through the profit system, ironically enough. Now, I don't want to get into too, too much because, the, um, because I know I'm somebody who kind of advocates like a moneyless society. I'm very passionate about that. So you mean a lot of people say, well, why the hell are you setting up a company? And the, the shorter answer is, is that because they really feel the best way to do things right here, right now. Yeah. We, we basically, we were putting out calls, getting investors in to do this thing. Like we, our education project, the Life Games books, this has been financed by our investors. Um, the FDA movie script is being financed by our investors. The Free World or website that I was mentioned earlier, this is, is being backed by the investors as well. So we, we've built up... Um, and and, and in a pool of a pool of money basically from people who are backing these projects, and the, the, the whole uh, the kind of delicious irony of it is that all these people are shareholders in this company, and if we start actually making money from this company, we can actually put money back to shareholders. I know that sounds completely counterintuitive, but actually. <laughs> My, the, my feeling no, is... We are where we are, right? You can only operate we, in, the, exactly. in the world that you're living we, in, you know what I mean? This is yeah. the we're in. And without that, if we don't do that, if we rely on volunteering, people doing stuff in their spare time, it's, it's a fucking mess. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that it doesn't... Society and our system is not... We are not organized enough to behave that way People now. don't feel responsible and accountable unless there's a deadline and they're getting paid for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. And, I mean, and of course, people have... Not just it's not just that it's not that people won't volunteer or that they are not passionate enough. It's that they also have jobs that they that they have to, to maintain to keep yeah. the roof over their heads. So you're kind of you're 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 badgering people to kind of give me an hour or two of your of your spare time here and there. And of course, you know, we don't have all that none of us have that much spare time. You know, we want to spend time with our families and the rest of the time we're working or sleeping. So, I mean, it's, it's trying to grab these little hours here and there from different people is a really, really bad way of organizing people. But if we, if we pay people and say, okay, we're going to, I'm going to, like, for example, the, we're, we're building an app for the Life Games books thing at the moment. Now I'm paying a, con a contractor to do that for me. And it's got, I know it's going to be done in four weeks' time. It's going to be finished. Where if that was doing with volunteers, it would go on and on and on and on and on. And it's, it's, it's just not an efficient way to do things. So yeah, I'm very much a realist at the same time. We have to deal with 
the situation, the way we are now, the, the society, the system that we're living in now, and use that as a springboard to actually create the system that we want. Good. All right. Well, Colin, thank you very much indeed for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, the, 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 sure, I, don't know, okay. I think for me personally, you've uh, you you presented a far more realistic and achievable vision of a pathway towards a moneyless and and uh, I don't I, I I actually am not great about the word, but compassionate society uh, than mm -hmm. than most activists I've spoken with. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, I will edit okay. this and get it up as quickly as I can. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thanks for your time. My pleasure. Bye-bye.